Uh, welcome to Planet Scale, making Planet Scale geospatial processing possible with BigQuery GIS. Uh, this morning we've got a really exciting show. We have two types of geospatial modeling and food supply, and it's before lunch, so um, these are going to be kind of the grains and the foods uh, and the proteins, I guess. Um, so on the first, on the top. Uh, top path across the top. It's going to be Descartes Labs. I'm one of the co-founders of Descartes Labs and how we leverage our Descartes Labs platform for machine learning for modeling various grain productions across the United States. And then we need to ship those grains around the world. And so how would you start to model and understand um, shipping and supply chain logistics and those types of challenges? Then David's going to come up and he'll be focusing more on the protein side of things and, and fishing. Uh, David's from Global Fishing Watch, and he's going to talk about how they leverage Earth Engine um, to observe and track vessels for illegal fishing. So uh, where these, things, these two workflows come together is on a common vector, set, ve vector data set, excuse me. Uh, and that's called AIS. If you're not familiar with AIS, that's an automatic identification system for how ships send their location to avoid collisions. And both Descartes Labs and Global Fishing Watch are both using BigQuery as a place to put these massive amounts of AIS data into um, BigQuery. And that, of course, is Google serverless, you know, <coughs> managed data warehouse. And so no matter how many billions and billions of rows of AIS data either of us get, we're not worried about uh, BigQuery being able to scale up or to be able to run our queries to provide that type of analysis. Then finally, for a really exciting uh, finale, we have Moshe. And Moshe is the, big query, the chief BigQuery officer. So I don't know how you get the chief BigQuery officer title, uh, but what's really cool is he's gonna show us behind the scenes, how Google built these geospatial functions. So that's really gonna be exciting. So um, it's been announced that BigQuery Geospatial is launching today in, for general availability. Um, this is the only cloud data warehouse that has first class support for geo GIS functions and GIS data types. So that means that GIS functions are now backed by the full force of the BigQuery team and BigQuery service level agreements. So that helps me at Descartes Labs write service level agreements and make sure my customers, um, I can get support and serve my customers. And so you might say, well, what's new in, uh, since the beta? If those of you that have been in the beta, um, I'll let you read through all of these features, uh, but I'll tell you about the, the two that we're leveraging at, at Descartes Labs. We're, we've really seen big improvements from the uh, ability of the speed of joins and how fast joins are running, and we do a lot of that, so that's been a big difference. And then STGeo from text, that's really um, useful for us for ingesting large polygons. Um, so those are two that, that are useful for us. I'm sure everyone has different workflows. Um, Descartes Labs, if you're not familiar with us, we were founded in 2014, and we're kind of this anomaly in the startup world, I guess. We're not in the Bay Area. Uh, we do have an office here and in New York, but we're up in the mountains of Santa Fe, New Mexico, where I can get a quick ski lap in before, before I head into the office in the morning. And we've been around for you know a little over four years, uh, and the reason we're up in the mountains is because myself and the rest of the founding team we're scientists and researchers and engineers at Los Alamos National Laboratory. And there we focused on, you know, our expertise were in er oops, uh, areas such as, uh, sorry, I'll go back, uh, machine learning, remote sensing, and kind of um, understanding how changes uh, impact the planet. So we, we leverage massive amounts of, of satellite data um, to build those types of models to see you know, what insights might impact our customers, uh, their supply chain, all of their logistics, and how can we help them become more efficient. Um, 
we leverage a wide range of GCP infrastructure to build our multi-tenant uh, machine learning SaaS platform. Um, and we originally built all of this for our own team and how to make our team as effective and productive as possible to be able to really rapidly iterate on machine learning models and train them, get results, tweak the models, retest, revalidate, and how can we do that in hyper-efficiency? And we've since externalized that to, our, uh, to a lot of different customers who have ideas besides just what we've done. And one of the benefits of GCP is, uh, you know, these are all microservices based and there's all types of persistent data stores that I can mix, mix and match each microservice to just pick the right persistence layer for that. And just like with microservices, you might want to um, with remote sensing, we also have to select the right use case for the right data set and be able to fuse those all together to come up with insights that actually matter. Um, so one of the fundamental challenges is, is being able to combine these, these data sets for the problem. It's not usually just one data set gives us the straight answer. And I think you're going to see that from both of us today. Um, and so when I say uh, satellites, uh, you, most people will think, and with satellites tracking ships, I would guess a lot of you might think uh, this beautiful picture of a ship on the ocean, and we look at this in, in red, green, blue, kind of the, the left column, uh, or the left part of this diagram. Um, but often there's a problem with this. Uh, there's a pesky thing called clouds, and I'm not talking about cloud computing, uh, it's clouds getting in between the, the, the satellite and the, and the Earth. And so those can abstract our view. So sometimes it works, and sometimes we get really good insights from that, but sometimes we have to look at other types of sensors. So if we move to the middle of this diagram, we see another type of sensor called synthetic aperture radar. And an example of this is from the European Space Agency. We have a satellite called Sentinel-2, and what, or Sentinel-1, excuse me. Uh, what this does is it sends a radar signal. The satellite itself sends a radar signal off the Earth. It bounces off the Earth, and then the satellite receives that signal on another orbit. Um, this is great because it penetrates right through clouds, so that's problem solved. Um, except the refresh rates aren't always really helpful when you're tracking global supply chains like, sh like shipping. And so that brings us to this third data set, and that's AIS. And so these ships are, are sending a, a message or a, a ping um, to a ground station, and the satellites are be able to see and locate where those radio frequencies uh, were transmitted from. So lots of pictures in this, this talk. I hope you're already, and that's fine with everyone. It's, it's GIS, so um, it's very visual crowd here. Um, on the left, we would have the types of um, the different uh, bands of light that we would use for modeling agricultural crops. So you can see there's the bright green and purple is showing, you know, basically photosynthesis and where it's occurring in, in the crop health. And so we're able to build models that, that kind of predict the yield. Uh, when we move over right one and we see that synthetic aperture radar, what you're actually seeing the differentiation there is the fields that have been recently plowed and slightly disturbed. That's the types of things we can see with Sentinel-1. Then you have a clay minerals ratio, and, and then finally on the far right, we have a, a high resolution, um, human visible red, green, and blue spectrums of light. So that's um, things we would use for more kind of computer vision or TensorFlow type models. Uh, that would be things like um, maybe detecting oil pads in this, this case. So um, when we work all over the world, we build crop models all over the world for all different types of crops. Um, in this talk, I can only kind of go into a little bit of detail about one, and I'll talk about corn. And you see, a, you might say, well, what's this uh, machine learning model of? Well, I think the only thing this could detect is the state of Iowa and maybe the city of Des Moines, but it probably isn't useful for classifying much else, really, on, on, in this example. Um, but we have a lot of really complicated processing steps to get, get to that point. We have to be able to identify and segment out 
all the different fields. We have to know what's like an urban area because um, we don't want to include those geographic areas into our models. Then we finally have to run a classifier to say, is this a corn field, a wheat field, a soybean field, those types of things. Um, and so then after we had those types of information, then we can finally start to estimate how much food is being produced in every single one of those fields and roll that up into various, you know, state level, a county level, a national level um, to be, be able to model the overall food supply and, and how that this year's crop production is going to, um, to come onto the market. And then we'll back test this for, you know, 10 or 15 years and seeing every single farm everywhere in the U.S. every day and then saying, how did that model do in that, that drought year? or in that, that year we had flooding in Iowa. And, and test the model at, at day 200, how did it do? So that's, and then we'll constantly iterate on that to try and make those models as accurate as we can. Um, so that gives us an idea how much food is being produced at what parts of the country. But one of the next things is often that's not where it's getting delivered to. It's going to somewhere else in the world. So problems we have to think about are, you know, what about rail capacity? How do you get from the field or the elevator to the river where you would have barges? And those barges would take um, these commodities down, down the river. Um, then there's traffic and traffic delays on, on places like the Mississippi River, believe it or not. Um, how busy are they? Is, is there delays at the port? Is weather gonna impact? those routes? Are there delays in places like the Panama Canal? Can I reroute and, and get you know, a more efficient uh, speed up or better fuel efficiency? Those types of things. Uh, so here's, uh, on the bottom we're showing optical. Uh, so that's the you know, human visible, red, green, blue, beautiful pictures that we talked about. And on the top we see the AIS route and, and, and um, that works even with cloud, cloud cover. So AIS, let's dive a little bit more into that. What is it? It's automatic identification system. So this is, is the message that ships are sending out to avoid collisions. It's sending you know, their unique ID, where their position, where their course is. And they send kind of, a, it, it's a ping message um, at, at given intervals to, to tell each other and, and track so they don't all collide. And this data set, like, almost any type of, of sensor data, we're seeing this just explode dramatically. Um, a single AIS vendor from, from just Descartes Labs, uh, just one vendor we use captures tens of, of billions of AIS pings a day. And so what's happening is we're having this explosion in, in space and as satellites go from these research uh, devices built by NASA that cost a half billion dollars to things that grad departments are building for a few thousand dollars and they're getting cheaper to put into space, that global coverage is getting quicker and quicker. So you're just seeing this infinite growth. So that's where having a, a no ops, I don't have to add disks or capacity or processing cores to be able to ingest that data starts to become really valuable. So here's a global visualization just to show you the traffic patterns and about 90% of of uh, global trade is actually done over, over the oceans. So as you recall, we are showing corn yields in Iowa. Um, we're like, you know, the next thing is being able to model and, and predict, you know, how, how delays or impacts uh, on those barges going down the waterways in the US. Um, where those, those delays are happening and, and how things are progressing. It's, it's not that different than, you know, if there was a delay getting off the Bay Bridge on your way here this morning, um, but this is for shipping. Um, and over the past few months, uh, or over just a few months, we've, we queried, um, I think this was a query over four months uh, on the Mississippi River. We saw, this is showing, we, we were able to query uh, down and see that there was a little over 350,000 ping messages for ships. On a like larger scale, okay, what's happening when they get down to the bottom of the Mississippi? 
So this is looking at ships that were in New Orleans and also in the Panama Canal, and where were they going? Um, and so this is what used to be an incredibly hard um, query to, to actually, actually execute, and it would be really hard if we were doing this in, in things, um, in other types of databases. Because it's just an in, in incredibly uh, long-running um, query. So finally, um, then what happens when we start to get into the Panama Canal? So in this scene, we're showing um, synthetic aperture radar, and you're able to see the ship starting to line up outside of the Panama Canal. And that's sending that radar signal down, and you'll be able to see the, the difference in the purple and green that you see the ships out there uh, and how that re signal reflects off the water. And, but again, remember the problem here is we're only getting passing over this spot in the Earth every few days. So it's not very high uh, <coughs> temporal cadence. So we need something better. So again, that's where we go back to things like being able to put this data into AIS and being able to, qu to query this AIS data sets into um, a queryable form. And then we can start to see the Panama Canal in much closer to real time um, with many, many data points. And you can see ships waiting on both the Atlantic and the Pacific side. Um, to the left is colored in dark is wherever ships have, have really slowed down and you can see kind of two congestion zones in the Panama Canal. And then in the green, we're seeing where ships are moving at a much, much quicker rate. So these are the types of models and insights we're trying to build for our customers to you know, really enable them to make better decisions on their shipping and supply chain and logistics and, and, um, and impact their business. And so that's great for grain and grain modeling, but the next we're going to turn it over to David and he's gonna talk about fishing. Thank you, Tim. Uh, hi, my name is David Kruzma and I am the Director of Research and Innovation at Global Fishing Watch. And I'm gonna share with you a similar workflow where we take uh, radar imagery um, from Sentinel-1 across the globe, process it using Google Earth Engine to identify where we think there are vessels all over the globe, and then combine that with AIS data using spatial BigQuery to identify where we think um, all the world's fishing vessels that are not broadcast in their location are. So I work for Global Fishing Watch. Global Fishing Watch, we're an independent nonprofit dedicated to improving transparency in the industrial fishing industry. We were originally founded in 2014 by Google and two nonprofits, SkyTruth and Google, although now we are our own nonprofit and we are entirely foundation supported. We have about 30 staff globally distributed, although we do meet up every now and then. Uh, and we have almost uh, 40,000 registered map users that go to our website, globalfishingwatch.org, which you can visit, and look at our interactive uh, map of fishing activity. So our goal is to increase transparency in the world's fishing industry. And when most of, you, when most of us think of fishing, uh, this is what we think of. However, this is not the fishing we are trying to track at Global Fishing Watch. We are trying to track fishing that looks much more like this. So this is a picture from China uh, at the end of their summer um, because at a, at a port where fishing vessels are leaving to fish. And the way China manages its fisheries is that during the summer, there's a three-month moratorium, actually now a four-month moratorium, where no fishing is allowed. And at the end of that, uh, all these vessels are allowed to go out and fish. And so if you're a fish, this is what's coming out for you. And you can zoom out and just see the scale of this fleet. And China does have the world's largest fleet, but this is not just China. You know, we are fishing all the world's oceans using large industrial vessels to, to catch fish. And of course, we eat this fish, but that's how we're, we're fishing the oceans. And what we've done at Global Fishing Watch is zoomed out one more time using all of that position data from AIS um, to map all of the fishing activity by large industrial vessels that have AIS. Um, AIS, as Tim mentioned, is a, is a system by which vessels broadcast their location so that other vessels can see where they are. And um, it's only required on large vessels. So again, we're only seeing the large ones here, but we can track what their activity is. So you may ask, uh, so why does this matter? I mean, it looks exciting, but why do we care about transparency in fisheries? Here's why. 
over a billion people in the world depend on fish for their primary source of protein. Yet one in third fisheries are overfished globally, and about one in five fish are caught through means that are illegal, unreported, or unregulated. So in summary, fish is critical to the global food supply, especially some of the poorer people on the planet, yet it has a high ecological cost. We're not doing it sustainably, and we're monitoring it extremely poorly, and it's also involved in a lot, there's also a lot of crime and illegal activity associated with it. So our belief is that if we can track fishing activity more, more efficiently, make it more transparent, we could make it, make it both more sustainable um, and also provide food for people. How do we do it? So our key technology is we, we use two machine learning algorithms, two, two uh, neural nets, to identify fishing activity. Um, and if you look at, these are showing the tracks of a trawler, which is a type of vessel that drags nets behind it, um, a longliner, which, which sets long lines of hooks, and a purseiner, which encircles um, circles fish with a net. And these are the tracks from the AIS data where we just plot how they move. And you can see with your eye how differently each of these vessels move. So we're able to train a classifier that guesses, based solely on how the boat is moving, what type of vessel it is. Uh, we also can tell what are non-fishing vessels, so we identify what are the tugboats, what are the, what are the tankers, um, what are the passenger vessels, um, so that we can ignore those and just look at the fishing vessels. We then have a second model, which is based on how these boats move, what is the, um, what is the uh, uh, likelihood that it's fishing. We put those two together onto a map, and we're able to make a global map of fishing activity by these vessels. And here it is for one year uh, of activity. And this is, um, this is probably the biggest I've ever projected this, this map, although I've looked at this many, many times. Uh, I love this map. It's beautiful to look at. It's exciting. You see all types of, I see new things every time I look at it. Uh, but it's not just a pretty map. Creating this global data set of fishing activity has had real impacts. In addition to being the first ever global map of fishing activity, the data has been used to help identify six places for marine protected areas, which has an area the size of Egypt. Uh, we've gotten a few countries, including Indonesia, Peru, and Panama, with Indonesia and Peru being uh, two of the top five fishing countries in the world, to commit to transparency. In the last three years, our data set and our, our research partners have produced over 20 peer-reviewed papers. And one of these papers identified how, um, looking at how boats fish, identified how subsidies are um, helping drive overfishing. And so we've now, that has led to an engagement with the World Trade Organization, where our data is being used in negotiations to identify how we can change $20 billion in fishery subsidies, a lot of which drive and promote overfishing. So this is really exciting. It's really great what we've been able to do. Um, but there's one problem, which is that not all the boats broadcast their location. And also, some of them don't broadcast the right location. So uh, so far, we have tracked the positions of all vessels voluntarily broadcasting their positions. What about vessels that tamper with their AIS device or broadcast wrong positions? So as, as a reminder, the way we're telling where these boats go is that there is a GPS device on these vessels with a radio that then broadcasts the latitude, longitude, timestamp, and a few other characteristics to other boats nearby and then also to satellites. Some vessels have changed the latitude and longitude that they're broadcasting, so it says they're somewhere else. We're not sure why some of them are doing this, but some of them are, and the result is you get wrong positions in the data. Here's a great example. Down there on the uh, bottom left of this, you see a boat says it's in the Southern Pacific. Then it says it goes south through Antarctica, then goes to negative 95 degrees south, which is impossible, and then back up. Uh, it's not there. It is, it is actually up there close to the coast of Peru going around South America. And we need some automatic way to identify this. And one thing we do know is we know, that we know when each message is received by a satellite, and we know where the satellite is when it receives that message. And so we can look at the position of the satellite, which has to, usually has to be within about 3,000 kilometers of the, of, the, of the boat to receive a message, to say roughly where in the world it is. But it turns out you get a much more accurate estimate of where that boat is if you take the average position of satellites that receive messages at the times they receive the message over a given day. So what you want to do is you want to take the average position of lat and long over a day of a vessel, and then the average lat and long of the satellite positions over a day, and compare them. So you need to do latitude, you need average lat and long. Uh, 
that's actually very tricky on a, on a sphere. And before spatial BigQuery, we did something like this. Oh yeah, so there's the vessel's actually up there. Before spatial BigQuery, uh, did something like this, which is a lot of trigonometry to turn the, the latitude and longitude into x, y, and z, and then average the x, y, and z, and then turn them back into latitude and longitude, and took 32 lines of SQL. And with spatial BigQuery, we are now able to do this in just the key calculation is just one line, where we turn st centroid ag and from the lat and longitude of all the points for a given day and then are able to get where that average location is. Uh, and this is a great, so the one thing I, I failed to say earlier is that all of our AIS data is in BigQuery, and we use it every day to use, do almost every analysis on what boats are doing, and it has uh, been incredibly useful um, in, in every way of analysis. And now, we, we started using it before spatial functions, and there's tons of cases where we figured out a really hard way to do something, and it turns out uh, spatial BigQuery can now save us tons of time and effort, and also allow us to do things we weren't able to do. Simple things like just calculating the distance between points is so much easier now. Uh, so here's one example. So we can identify these vessels more easily that have their offsetting their position. But there's a bigger problem, which is that most fishing vessels don't broadcast AIS. We call this the dark fleet. And a lot of them aren't regulated to carry it, so they don't have to. But you can also imagine that if you are want to engage in, in illegal activity, you are most likely not to broadcast AIS. So we want to see these boats. How can we do it? Well, one thing we can do is use uh, radar. So as Tim talked about, there's a, this is a sat satellite called Sentinel-1 from the European Space Agency that uh, has radar. And the radar can penetrate clouds and, and see, see bright objects on water. So this is a composite image over several months. And if you look between the United Kingdom and Europe, that's what you're looking there, the English Channel, you can see all those dots, which look, that's the shipping lanes. And that's because metal objects on water show up as really bright in radar. And what we can do is we can look at these scenes and we can count where there are likely vessels. Sentinel-1 is the satellite we're using, and it covers all the world's terrestrial service. It doesn't do the oceans, but it does do all the world's coastlines, and most vessels are close to shore. So what we've done is we said, okay, we're going to process all of the Sentinel-1 that overlaps with the coastlines. Uh, that's a few hundred thousand images and over a petabyte of data. How do we process a petabyte of radar imagery? As I said, we're a small nonprofit. Uh, we don't have tons of servers sitting around. But we do have Google Earth Engine. And Google Earth Engine has two features that make it extremely useful for us. The first is that they have, it's a data catalog. And so they've organized satellite imagery from tons of the most useful, freely available satellite archives, including, say, the entire, and they have the entire Sentinel-1 archive just sitting there in servers so that we don't need to download and pre-process it. Then built on top of that, there's a computational platform that allows you to do um, analyses at scale distributed across all of these, um, all, all of these, uh, uh, all of these images. So we can figure out a process for one image from Sentinel-1 and then hit run and run it across the whole globe. Here's a picture of what the, the viewer of it looks like. So there's a nice JavaScript, uh, there's a nice um, uh, web-based uh, um, JavaScript editor. Here at the top, you can, see, you can edit your code and then you can hit share it. It has an interactive map that you can look at and, and work on. Um, and so you can kind of play with it and see what images look like as you're analyzing them. Um, and, then, and then run. There's also, there is also a uh, Python API. And so we use the JavaScript tool to kind of do the inspections, write the code, and then we move it over and write, use the, job, use the Python API when we want to put it into production to run across, um, to run, um, across the whole globe, although you can also do some of that in the um, JavaScript console. So let's look at one of these Sentinel-1 scenes. Let's zoom in. So this is what it looks like. Uh, the way you're looking on the left there is Italy. On the right is Croatia. This is in the Adriatic Sea. It's about 200 miles across is one scene. The dark area there is the footprint of the scene that we have analyzed. And all of those dots are where our algorithm uh, that we use in Earth Engine that is just looking for bright spots on the water, says that there are probably vessels on vessels. Now we want to compare this with the AIS data, which is also in BigQuery, to say which of these dots are fishing boats, which of these are not fishing boats, and which of these are vessels that do not have AIS. 
To do that's a little complicated because you can imagine the satellite image is taken at one time, and then your AIS positions aren't always exactly at the point of the satellite. They may be a little bit before, they may be a little bit after, and you need to do some smart interpolation between those two points to get the most likely position of the vessel at the time of the satellite to match it to these detections. Also, you want to clip it to just this scene so you compare it to only the scene you're looking at, and I don't have to process and compare all the points outside. So what we've done is we've loaded all of this information into, into BigQuery from the, the output of Earth Engine. So we take the output of Earth Engine, which gives us all of these positions messages, and then also we take the outline of the footprint, so a polygon of the footprint of the, that image, and we upload the footprint, that, that footprint as a well-known text into BigQuery, as well as all these detections. And then we can do a join on the AIS data. So we interpolate the, SI data, uh, the AIS data and then do an ST contains for, for points that are within the footprint of the satellite at the right position to identify which vessels are most likely to match up with which detections from radar. And then this scene, lots of vessels use AIS. So we can match, um, match it quite well. And so the red dots there are things that we think are fishing vessels. The, the turquoise ones are ones that are non-fishing vessels. And the gray ones are ones that we are not matched. Uh, they could be objects in the water. We're identifying those another way. But a lot of them are vessels that do not broadcast AIS. Zoom out to the entire Adriatic Sea. You can see Italy's on the left there. And to the right is, uh, is the former Yugoslavian countries. And then in the south is Greece. And this is all detections over one year in this area. And you can see the shipping lanes. You can see some fishing activity. And we now are able to put all this into BigQuery and match it at scale to identify which of these we think are non-fishing vessels, which of these are fishing vessels, and which of these are not matched. If you look um, on the right, on the, the east coast there, on the east side of the, the, the sea, close to what is Albania, you see a bunch of gray activity. Albania does not require its fleet to carry AIS, so it, that could be the fishing fleet. And we've done one more thing here, which is we have trained a model to identify based solely on where an object is in the ocean uh, using features such as the, the, the bathymetry, the slope of the bathymetry, the whether or not it's close to a shipping lane, the distance from shore, all, all these features which we actually generated um, with joins in BigQuery. We use those features on each observation and are able to make a guess about whether it's a fishing boat or a non-fishing vessel. I've also added in the bottom here a, a dotted line here, that, that yellow dotted line, which is the area of a proposed marine protected area. Um, okay, so, sorry. I've, so we trained a model, and we're able to guess with some confidence, you know, some probabilistically, that those red dots are likely fishing vessels. So you can see that's, that's a dark fleet of fishing vessels there on the, on the right side that are most that are not broadcasting. Why does this matter? Well, the yellow dotted line there is a, a marine protected area that's been proposed in the southern Adriatic. And so we had a nonprofit in Europe come to us and say, Do you, you know, can you tell us what fishing activity is happening within this proposed area? Because we want to talk with the fishing industry and have negotiations about where this marine protected area will be, how much fishing will be affected by it, um, and we don't know how much fishing is there. So we're able to use this method to then, now let's zoom into that, that area. And there's a bunch of fishing on the, on the um, west side on the left that you can't see because it's underneath the turquoise dots. And let's just look at the fishing and zoom in. And we're able to say that this is, this is the fishing activity over 2017 of vessels within that proposed area, uh, which is now extremely useful for having those discussions about, about where, where to site this marine protected area. So again, we're trying to create transparency in the world's fishing industry. Use, being able to use spatial BigQuery has been a huge assist to us, because as we, we spend so much of our time in BigQuery, analyzing data, processing things. And these functions have allowed us um, to really get another few steps forward in creating transparency in fishing. And the reason we want to create transparency in fishing is because we want more places like this. This is a real picture taken by one of our research partners, um, um, teams, Enrique Sala of National Geographic Pristine Seas, that shows off a, a marine protected area uh, that is an incredible abundance of sharks. And our goal is to protect, you know, have as many places like this as we can in the world. And one of the ways we can do that is to illuminate the world's dark fleets, which we think will help end uh, illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing 
uh, by industrial fishing vessels. Uh, thank you very much. And now I'm going to hand it off to Moshe, who is the chief BigQuery uh, engineer. I, I, I do have to say I've been doing BigQuery now for the last three and a half years. And I, I did take a selfie with him earlier because I was very excited to meet <laughs> the man behind uh, what, what we've been using at, at Global Fishing Watch. All right, thank you, David. <clears throat> so it's been really fascinating for me to listen to both of those talks from Tim and David and see how things that we built into product, into BigQuery, how they're used in the real world for, for such a great causes. So my portion of the work is going to be about, I will tell you how BigQuery was able to achieve all those, to, to, to be able to power those applications and to be able to do those spatial analysis at such a big scale. So I'm going to talk about every single detail and every single algorithm. Well, maybe, maybe not every single one, but uh, hopefully the most important ones and explain how it works. So um, one little warning, there will be a little bit of math in this presentation, but nothing too hard, nothing like high school schoolers cannot deal with. Okay, so let's start. Uh, one of the great things about working in Google is that we have world expert on about every single subject. And of course, Google has been doing, you know, geography, dealing with geography data and location data for a very, very long time. We have products like Google Maps and Google Earth Engine and Google Search is obviously location aware and Android. And you know what? It's really easier to find products which don't use locations. So there is a lot of expertise inside Google. And all those products are a little bit different, but at the heart of all of them, at the core of them, is this amazing low-level library called S2 Geography Library, Geometry Library, which deals with lo very low-level details, which also tricky details, you know, how you do all the trigonometry and how you do it on a surface of the Earth. So really, what we were building was standing on the shoulders of giants, and uh, you know, we were using now, this technology started in 2005. It's 15 years in making. It's very mature, robust, battle-tested. And by the way, it's open source, so it's not just Google who uses it. There are many other companies. Probably the other uh, most well-known one is Pokemon Go. And I don't know if anybody is still playing, but uh, it is something that we felt really good about. And remember when I said uh, we have all the world experts, so the guy behind this library Eric Wich, is legendary. When he was a PhD student, he worked on computer graphic, and his thesis was on ray tracing, and that algorithm is still used in pretty much every ray tracing software today. He actually got Oscars for it. You know, if you watched Monsters Incorporated, so that's his work. Anyway, he just happens to work out of Seattle, same building, same floor as BigQuery team is. So when we worked on BigQuery JS and we had some tricky question, all I had to do is stand up, walk 20 meters, say, hey, Eric, you know, how we deal with polygons crossing anti-meridian near poles? And he'll say, oh, just do this and that. OK, so we will be going now into the internals of S2. And stay with me. I'll explain later how we use it inside BigQuery and why is it useful and why is it great. OK, so we start with uh, our first assumption that uh, Earth is round. And you know, we're all grown ups here. We, of course, know that this is not true. Um, and I, I don't mean that the world is flat, but um, it's not actually a sphere, right? It's, it's an ellipsoid. But you know, a sphere is easier to work with. And uh, another nice thing that all the topological property of ellipsoid are preserved on a sphere, only distances become different, so we can compensate for it later. OK, so we're starting with round Earth. But first thing we do, you know, it's hard to index on a sphere. So first thing we do is say, well, what if Earth was actually a cube? All right, so we draw a cube around the Earth, and we project every single point to the faces of cube. There are six of them. And why is it simpler? Because the faces of the cube are actually flat. And on a flat surface, we can do all the arithmetics and you know, all the calculations much, much easier. OK, so how do you actually project from a sphere to a cube? Well, for single point, it's very easy, right? The, the formula is trivial. But then what happens is when you project an area, if it's closer to equator, right in the middle, it will be smaller. 
If you go north or south, it becomes bigger. And actually, distortion becomes as big as five times bigger. And this is not good if we want to do precise indexing. So we have to do some adjustment. Oops. Yeah, we have to do some adjustments. Again, it becomes a little bit tricky to do exact adjustments. We need to do arc tangents, and that's, by the way, the math I was referring to. That's end of the math, uh, which is very expensive. So what S2 came up with, really nice quadratic approximation, which is almost as precise as trigonometry and almost as fast as a linear one. Okay. So now we have a method of projecting points and areas into the face of the cube. So let's take one of the faces of the cube. Right? There are six of them. So this is one. And you see, we already projected through. You see how it flat it is? Because it's on a cube. So now, in order to index it, we're going to build a tree. And usually in computer science, when people talk about trees, they talk about binary trees. But since it's two-dimensional now, we build what's called quad tree. So we take the whole face and divide it into four squares, OK? And then take each one of those squares and divide it again into four squares. And we do it again and again and again. Actually, we do it 30 times. So we have 30 levels in our tree. And each one of those squares is called cube. So we have 2 in power of 30 by 2 in power of 30. So it's 2 in power of 60 different cells. If you look at the cell, the lowest level, at the level 30, it's about one square centimeter. So we have six faces. It nicely fits into 64-bit integer. So just think about it. I'm working here on a scene, and each my step, I'm covering hundreds of those cells. And each one of them has unique integer associated with it. I think it's great. So we are using those integers as our indexes. Now. To get good spatial indexing, by the way, you know, we often talk about how big query, you know, it's everything is scanned and there are no indexes. So this is, of course, simplification. Of course, behind the scenes, it uses all kinds of tricks, okay, just not visible to the user, which is a great thing for the user because you don't have to worry about it. We do it for you. So the next thing we need to do is to figure out how to connect all those cells together, right? It's two-dimensional. And we built what is called sp space filling curve, and we use Hilbert curve here. And nice property of this curve is points which are close together in the real world, usually, not always, but most of the time, end up being close to each other on this curve. Okay, for example, you know, those two cells are close to each other, they will be right next to each other. Of course, there are exceptions, and Sorry, this is too far. Can I jump and show you a couple of points which are close in the real world but end up being far on Hilbert curve? But this is relatively rare. Okay, so to recap, we took round Earth, put it into cube, projected, put Hilbert curve, and you may wonder, like, what does this has to do anything with BigQuery and JS, and you know how are we going to use it? So now I will walk you through a real example how it's used. Okay, we are looking at polygon. And people from New York will immediately identify this polygon. This is, of course, Metropolitan Museum of Arts. In, um, okay? So the polygon is a little bit complex. There are like dozen edges and whatnot. And let's say what we wanted to do, we also have a lot of points, and we want to find out which ones are inside the museum and which one outside. So to do it exactly is actually a computationally expensive thing if we were to check it for every point. So this is where we start using our indexes. So what we do first is we try to find a minimal cell out of those you know, hierarchical cells which completely covers our polygon. Okay? So here's one. And it also covers some area which is not in the museum. In fact, more than half of it. So we say, OK, well, we don't have to use single integer. Right? We can use say, those are four cells. So it becomes a little better. We can use eight cells, we can use 16 cells. So what BigQuery does, every time you have geography object in BigQuery, it automatically picks the most optimal covering of those cell ideas. And remember, each one is just an integer. And it does it free of charge, right? You're not paying anything for it. We do it for you. You're not paying for storage. You're not paying for computations. It's all transparent, OK? So 
there is a trade-off, of course. We don't want to use too many indexes, but we also don't want to use too few. So it depends on the shape, depends on how many points you have. As I want to say we use machine learning for that, but you know, we use algorithms for that. Um, so we build it. So the next step is now you have all those points, and you need to figure out which are inside and which one's outside. And now we have this very, very fast algorithm. Each point has its own S cell, S2 cell, and our object has its own cell covering. So all we need to do is to compare integers to quickly figure out which points have absolutely no chance of being inside polygon. And if you think about it, if you have millions of them, we can you know, prune out a lot of them very, very quickly. Now, of course, there will be some false positive. Again, I, I, I cannot show and laser doesn't work here. There are a couple of points which are inside cover, outside of museum. We'll have to check them separately, but hopefully this number is small. So BigQuery actually does much more than that. It also computes the covering of every shard of data. And you know, if you have points somewhere in Seattle or San Francisco, obviously they have no business, we have no business checking, you know, if they're in New York. So we can very quickly prune out all of those partitions. And again, all of that happens completely automatically. Um, but for those algorithms to be effective, we also want to make sure that points which are physically close together, they also end up close together inside data of BigQuery table. And this is where the Hilbert curve that we talked about will be useful. So you know how BigQuery has clustering, which usually only works with integers and strings? Well, we can also do clustering by geography. Not today, but very soon we will release it. So um, I'm pre-announcing this. Could I do that? Oh, nobody from our team. OK, it doesn't matter. OK, I'm pre-announcing that very soon you will be able to take your table with geography in it and just say cluster by it, and you are going to get you know, very skip those, you know, you will get special clustering and your performance is going to be great. And as we saw in those applications which analyze the entire world, it's already great, it will become even greater. Okay, so to recap today, we looked a little bit into how BigQuery internals work and we looked at a couple of really amazing applications that people built on top of it. And uh, you can find on those links um, more info about it, and we're looking forward to you building your application. Thank you.